we do consultancy services in the financial management, financial accounting, management technology, tax matters like excise, tax, and service tax, and income tax. As a part of our consultancy services, we are conducting the IDP program, that is the Intellectual and Development programs, on various subjects like financial accounting, management accounting, on the tax, like branch, service tax, excise, etc. So we are doing this in the last seven years uh, as a part of our consultancy services. And uh, today we are going to deal with the Karnataka value added tax. As you know, the subject is, I mean, uh, has grown. Multi force is that it was introduced in 2005. So uh, that is why from 200 pages book, now we have become 600 pages. That is mainly because of amendments, notification, re-notification, cancellation of notifications, and, uh, uh, and also because of the case laws coming up before the judiciary on the interpretation of the value added tax. Uh, here one thing is that, and I hope you are all dealing with the value added tax, you must be familiar with the basic concepts of the principles. Because whoever was doing earlier the sales tax, I mean it is on the same length but on a different footing. So whatever interpretation that was there in the earlier on the Karnataka Sales Tax Act about various aspects, like who is a dealer, what is business, what is turnover, what is taxable turnover, what is total turnover. So the, the interpretation that were given by the judiciary in the Sales Tax Act also equally applicable in the VAT also as far as they are imposed in the VAT. But there are some other things. The main difference between the VAT and the Sales Tax is only, as you know, there were, more, there were only if you can take the credit on purchase tax, the sales tax that you pay to the on the purchases that you obtain. But that in, a, the, the, in the case of the sales tax, I mean, once you pay the tax, it is gone. So the, there are many disputes relating to the interpretation of the rate of the tax. Whether the rate of the tax is 5%, whether the rate of tax is 14%, whether the rate of tax is 18%. Because everybody wants to pay the minimum tax rate. But in case of that, it is just, I mean, uh, controversy to the extent is reduced. Because even if you pay 14% instead of 5%, you can take the input tax credit. Only the dealers who take the input tax credit, for them, I mean, the rate of the tax is not a main dispute. In many cases, perhaps it does uh, to their advantage. Because they take the input tax credit immediately, but they may wait to supply after two months or three months. So that the disputes regarding the rate of the tax have gone down sufficiently because of the input tax credit. Uh, whereas in case of sales tax, there were many I mean, uh, the disputes about the rate of the tax itself. So as far as the VAT is concerned, if I, you know, um, thinking that you are aware of the um, main concepts of the VAT, but uh, in the, when you go deeper into the subject, you will find whether uh, what you are doing is right or not, what is the interpretation of this, etc. So for that purpose, actually, you have to be familiar with the fundamentals of the VAT. So the fundamentals of the VAT, may, many times we do not look at the section 2 at all. Actually, the foundation for the VAT is section 2, which defines the various things. So every interpretation based, is based on the definition. For example, worst contract. What is a worst contract, whether the particular thing is a worst contract or not? So well, let, let us say a person is doing the maintenance work for the building, maintenance of the hotel, whether it is a worst contract or no. So first you have to go into the definition to find out whether it is really a worst contract or no as per the definition. So even if it goes to the judiciary, they will only look at the definition and give the judgment accordingly. Who is a dealer? 
because only the dealers are liable to pay the tax. The non-dealers are not liable to pay the tax. So you should know who is the dealer that is also the same that. Number three is who orders business. Because the liability to register, the liability to collect and pay the tax is only with the registered dealers. Registered dealers, I mean, um, they should do the business. Suppose you are there, you bought a car five years back, you sell the car today. Are you liable to that? Huh? Why yes, why no? Are you liable to that? Individual no. Individual no. Individual no. Individual no. Individual no. So then, number one is, you are not a dealer. You are not a dealer because of what? I do not do the You are not doing the business. So here, yeah, because you are not a dealer, because you are not doing any business. This car has been bought to you for personal use. So when you sell that car, which has been bought for personal use, but not for business purposes, then you are not liable to be registered. Only registered dealers have to pay the tax. That is why there is no that. So in this graph, as you can see, as you go on, except individuals who are not doing any business, and the state government, that is state government of Karnataka, the rest of them fall under the definition of the dealers. Whether it is a central government, whether it is a public sector undertaking, whether it is state state government undertakings also. Except the state government and the individuals who are not doing the business, the rest of them will fall under the definition of the dealer. Even a casual dealer also. Casual dealer means once in a while he buys goods and sells. He is also liable for VAT. He is also liable for registration. So why I am saying this is the definition are most important. So uh, unless you know the definition, you cannot be able to interpret even goods. So a dealer is liable to pay the tax on the sale of the goods. Is it not? The dealer is liable to pay the tax is levied or not on the sale of goods. If there is no sale of goods, then the dealer is not liable to pay the tax. Suppose let us say uh, we uh, I mean a uh, uh, builder, he builds a flat. He builds a, let us say, a hotel. He builds, um, uh, let us say, a uh, bridge. Whatever it may be, I mean, um, he sells the flat. He sells a building. He is still able to tax. A builder builds flats. He buys the land. On his land, he builds the flats. And he sells the Class which are completed. Is he liable to tax? No. no. Why? It is not a good. It is huh? a capital good and it doesn't come under the national post. That is correct. So he is not liable to tax because by definition, there is a definition for the goods. So there are certain characteristics to call an item as a goods. First of all, a goods should be what? It should be a movable property. It should be movable. It should be transferable by delivery. Suppose I take this bond and I give him. The ownership goes from me to him. That means it is movable, it is transferable by delivery. You become the rightful owner when the transfer is takes place. The physical person is changed from one person to another person in pursuance of a contract, not because somebody steals and he becomes the owner now. In pursuance of the contract, if the possession of a movable property is given, the title of the movable property is changed from one person to another. So it should, it should be a movable property, it should be transferable by delivery. And the third and most important thing is, it should be marketable. If it is not marketable, it may be movable property, it may be transferable by delivery, but if it is not marketable, it is not at all books, you are not liable to pay any tax. Suppose we see many semi-finished items in the market. So let us say the motorcycle manufacturer, I mean, makes a uh, petrol tank, which is not painted, which is not finished. Suppose for any reason he says that, 
he will not he is not liable to pay the tax because that is not a goods because it is not marketable nobody buys and sells the i mean uh, unfinished petrol tank in the market so they, these are some of the most important thing one is it should be mobile it should be transferable by delivery and it should be marketable so if it is not marketable it is not a good so when a builder builds a flat it is not a mobile property that is why it is not liable for sales tax and the state cannot levy any tax on the sales of immobile property because under the constitution the state is empowered to levy the tax only on the sale of goods so why we are saying this is i mean the definitions are more important uh, for you when you go deeper into the subject so unless you are familiar with the definition you will not be able to understand the concept so first we will we will go to the definition a little longer before that we will just go and look into the karnataka value added tax amendments 2012 so briefly we will look into that as and when we go into this specific area then we will see further so this is the first amendment by section 401 so this is on the <coughs> Rate of tax on the cigarettes, tobacco, and other manufactured tobacco that has been increased from 15 to 17 percent from dissolved effective from 1/4/2012. Number two, a new provision has been added to 4/1. So, <coughs> so this is what the act. Hello. So the rate of the tax in 2011 has been increased to 5 percent on the declared goods under the CST act. So the state cannot levy a tax higher than the tax that is levied under the CST on declared goods. Declared goods like steel, iron. There are also many goods which are given under the CST which are called as a declared goods. So on the declared goods they cannot levy for, for more than the rate of the tax under the Central Tax Act. So last year the CST Act has been amended. On 8/4/11, increasing the rate of the tax from 4% to notification. I mean, it has not been brought to the notice of the public. It has been brought to the notice of the public only on 11th April. But last year, under the VAT Act, they have increased the rate of tax on declared goods to 5% from 8/4 itself. So after representation, they are given a minor relief. That means from 8/4 to 11/4, the rate of the tax even on declared goods is only 4 percent. Because I mean, it, it, there is it is not a technical debate, but it is only uh, uh, what we should. It is not being brought. It is no press release has been issued. Nobody was aware of that. That is the only thing. So only for that three days, it has been reduced to four percent. I mean, this is a retrospective effect. Whoever, I mean, uh, paid higher rate, they can claim the refund. Of course, now it is time off. Then section 11C was amended to prevent double deduction of input. So in the case of the worst contract, what we are saying is the builders who build or any worst contract, who any worst contractor, what has happened is. The worst in case of the worst contract, they can they are eligible to take uh, the credit. See, uh, under the constitution, as I told you, the state can levy the tax only on the sale of the goods. Suppose in case of the worst contract, the building. Suppose you have you have the land, you are the builder to build the land, um, the flat on the on your land. So he builds the land. That's what we will uh, say later in the detail. So he is the contractor, and you are the contractee. So in case of this, he has to pay the tax only on the goods. So the goods here, what the in when building the building, when uh, constructing the flat or constructing a building, there are not only uh, the contractor uses the material, he uses the labor, he uses the management services. So the state cannot levy any tax on the labor, management services, etc. So they can levy only the tax on the goods. So actually, prior to the amendment of the constitution, the states could not levy any tax on the worst contract. But only after the constitution has been amended, saying empowering the state to levy on the deemed sale of the goods in the execution of worst contract. Deemed sale of the goods. 
So that means when the builder constructs the building, not only he uses the labor material, etc., so the uh, state can levy the tax on the material portion that has been transferred. It is deemed to transfer from the contractor to the contractor. So for that purpose, what it says is it allows the labor and other like charges. Like he uses the consumables. He uses the management services. So all those things can be, suppose he constructed the building and he sold, sorry, the first contract value is for one lakh. So and in the one lakh, he keeps a separate because what is the material, what is the labor, what is consumables, etc. Let us say that is 40,000. So he has to pay the tax only on 60,000, which is the deemed transfer of the goods in executing the first contract. So here what has happened is, uh, so the uh, act itself gives that direction. If you are keeping the record separately for materials, now you can direct and pay only on the balance of the portion. But what happens is, you are buying the consumables. Hello? You are directing the labor, you are directing the management services and the consumables which are 40,000. But you are keeping, the, you, when you buy the consumables, naturally you are charged for the tax. So that becomes your input tax. So what this amendment says is, you cannot deduct the input tax on the consumable if you are aware of the deduction under labor and other charges because they are already you are deducted. This becomes a double deduction. Right. So that is the significance of the amendment. It only explicitly dissolves any deduction towards consumables if the if you have the deduction towards labor and other like charges. That means we need to keep separate track of consumables also. We put that's taken on. Yeah, you must, if you are buying the consumables, you are naturally I mean, uh, taking the input tax credit. You cannot take the input tax credit. It should be debited to the consumables account itself. Okay. Or not? See, if you are buying the consumables, let us say you are bought, let us say, um, green. So if you are bought for 100 rupees, assuming the tax rate is 14 and half. So this under and 14 and half. So if you are eligible for input tax credit, what you do is you debit the lubricants account, consumables under rupees. This tax you debit to the input tax recoverable account and the total will go to the supplier account. But here you cannot take the input tax credit because you are already deducting this under labor and other light charges. There we are taking only 40 percent of this, you know. 40 percent of? 40 percent of consumables total 100 rupees. That is standard deduction. Standard deduction. Suppose uh, there are various methods which will go little later. But here what happens is standard uh, uh, standard uh, deduction that is not 40 percent. It is one and the same. Because there uh, the standard deduction is towards labor and other charges which includes consumables. Yeah, that, so again you cannot take the credit for this input tax credit. Because, follow it. So that is why what they say is, when you are debiting the consumable, the entire under 14.5 will go to the consumables account as an expenditure, which in turn goes into the labor and other charges. Follow it. So when we have both work contract as well as uh, regular building, yeah. that time, what contract and? Regular uh, uh, materials supply. Uh, building supplies. In the sales of goods. Uh, sale of goods. Uh, like? Uh, like we are in the PV uh, industry. Hmm. See what we do is we we'll, we have a manufacturing uh, consumer uh, factory. Hmm. See there we will buy a consumables hmm. for other other than manufacture of the goods. Hmm. And where we will consume, uh, consumables for this uh, construction of building also. You are you are doing what's contract also? Yeah, what's contract also. Uh, that time you have to keep separate records. Yeah, that's what you have to keep separate records of the consumables which are used for the what's contract and separate records for the consumables which are used for your manufacturing purposes because here input tax credit is not allowed. So that is a uh, that is one thing. The the uh, under is section 18A. So as you know TDS section 18A was to deduct the TDS on the purchases. So the TDS is to be deducted on certain purchases by the buyer. 
But so that section was struck off by the High Court as unconstitutional and ultra virus of the Kevin Act. So that was long back and now 142012, the section itself has been deleted from the Act. From 2011 itself, it was in the case of Summer Enterprises, the High Court struck off that section saying that no TDS can be directed by the buyer on the purchases. So, but that section is itself now removed from the Grant Act. So, there is no deduction by the buyer on certain purchases made. Then, section 30. So, this is one of the important amendments. What is section 30? Hmm? So, section 30, as you know, it relates to the debit and credit notes. So, section 30 was relating to the debit and credit note. It was saying that if you are charged a tax less, then you issue a debit note for the difference in the tax. But there was no time limit. Similarly, it was saying if you are charged excess tax, you should issue the credit note. But for issue of the credit note in respect of excess charge, the time limit was six months. Outside six months, you cannot issue any credit note for the tax charge. So similarly, in case of return of the goods, you should issue the credit note within six months of the date of the sale, provided the goods are returned within the six months of the date of delivery. Okay? So that is, that's now what has happened is that section 30 is itself deleted. So section 30 is deleted means, what does it mean? What does it mean? Section 30 relating to the debit and credit notes has been deleted. So it does not mean that you should not issue, you cannot issue debit or credit notes. That means there is no law which governs the issue of debit and credit notes. There is no law which governs the issue of the debit and credit notes and the debit and credit notes can be issued on the basis of the commercial principles but there are certain restrictions even with respect to that for the credit, credit note to be issued in respect of the return of the course, etc., which we will see. So for the time being, the section 30 relating to debit and credit note has been deleted, but the debit and credit note can still be issued based on your commercial practice and subject to such a restriction with reference to the return of the goods. That we will see a little later. Huh? One of the important amendments, section 35. So what is the amendment here? Section 35, it deals with the filing of the revised returns. So what is the time limit for filing a revised return? You can file a revised return when there is any omission in the original return. Suppose you are not taking input tax credit on one invoice. So you can file a revised return. Or you have taken excess input tax credit, you can file a revised return. Or you have committed an error in taking input tax credit, you can file a revised return. So what is the time limit for filing the revised return? Six months after the end of the tax period. So now what has been amended is from 1-4-2012, you can then the time limit is there. Six, within six months, you can file the revised return after the end of the tax period. But there is one simple complication that that means any revised return <coughs> says, suppose if you want to file the revised return, so now we are in the month of August. August is over. So for the month of August. 2012, actually up to six months you can file a revised return. That is September, October, November, December, January, February 2012. So the time limit for filing the revised return is up to February 2012. But here, this, as per this amendment, which is effective from 1 for 2012, you can, for the August month of for the August, month of the August, you can file the revised return. <coughs> what it says? The filing of the revised return has only hour before 20th for the following month, succeeding the relevant month. So, for August, 
What is the following month? September, September 2012. So succeeding month for the September is what? October. So you can file the revenge return on or before 20th October 2012 for the month of August, August 2012. So as per this amendment, Section 34 was amended in such a way that dealers can file the revenge return of a month only on or before 20th of the following month succeeding the relevant month. So the relevant month here is August. Following month of August is September. The succeeding month is October 20th. So you can file on or before 20th October. That is in a simple language. You can file a revenge return of a month within let us say one, one month and 20 days. Within one month and 20 days. So that is one part of that. But if you want to file beyond that, but within six months, if you want to file a revenge return beyond that, but within six months, you have to take the permission of the consent that officer. So actually, you don't understand why this permission is not, but uh, uh, <coughs> because that permission again is a under area of interaction with the that officer unnecessarily. So there is no reasonable ground for amending that section that you have to take the permission from the that authority for filing the revenue with the activity beyond one month and 20 days. But as on... Sorry, permission. It is corresponding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Till today they have not introduced any form for that. So one thing is you have to you have to write to him that you want to file, suppose you are filing the revenge return for August in the month of November. So you have to write to him that uh, due to this reason I want to file a revenge return for the August within, uh, uh, since that is within the outer time limit of six months. He has to give, he cannot refuse the permission. Suppose in case where he refuses the permission for invalid grounds, then you have to go on your bill. Any revenge return has to be filed for that tax period. If you want to revise the return of August, you have to file the revenge return for the month of August whenever you want to file within 26 months subject to permission. If you have committed any error in the September return, then you have to file separately. If you are not taking any input cash credit in the month of August, naturally you would not have taken in September. Uh, why, why is the question? Uh, that is for the September purchases. Is it not? But the carry over in the carry over the carry over the carry over carry over carry over. I think uh, by default you have to file it on next month also because otherwise the carry over will not carry over. So he has not taken the August itself. I have some items he has not taken, but some items he has taken. Some items he has taken that is valid. I mean that you would have adjusted again output tax or you would have not taken. See, I have the balance of refund of the amount of income tax credit for let us say one thousand rupees. But I filed September return on the Okay. Okay. Then finally, I get no finance for the 